Good morning. If I look less relaxed than when I'm in Blackburn Presbyterian Church, it's because I am. We're in Bondi and that is not the real reason I'm not relaxed. It's beautiful and you can probably get a sense that the, it's a beautiful sunny day here and we have been for a walk along the cliff tops, but we are recording in unfamiliar surroundings in my daughter and son-in-law's lovely kitchen actually, but also without the usual props that we have in Blackburn. So we're actually on holiday, but in a lockdown, it's not very easy to ask a fellow retired minister to come and stream a service. So we're recording this in Bondi and the plan is to upload it to Facebook as Graham did with the Good Friday service. So after that intro, I'm about to read now and the Bible reading um, as we continue through Ma Matthew's Gospel is Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, the first 13 verses, which I knew as a child as the parable of the ten virgins. This version says the parable of the ten girls. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there were ten girls who took their oil lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and the other five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any extra oil with them, while the wise ones took containers full of oil for the lamps. The bridegroom was late in coming, so the girls began to nod off and fall asleep. It was already midnight when the cry rang out, here is the bridegroom, come and meet him. The 10 girls woke up and trimmed their lamps. Then the foolish ones said to the wise ones, let us have some of your oil because our lamps are going out. No, indeed, the wise ones answered. There is not enough oil for you and for us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourselves. So the foolish girls went off to buy some oil and while they were gone, the bridegroom arrived. The five girls who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was closed. Later, the other girls arrived. Sir, sir, let us in, they cried out. Certainly not. I don't know you, the bridegroom answered. And Jesus concluded, be on your guard then, because you do not know the day or the hour. May God bless his word to us. Thank you, Christine. And hello from me as well. This is a kind of kitchen service that we're offering today. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy uh, being with us for this time. I'm going to suggest we begin with prayer. So shall we pray now? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. As we've been working through Matthew, it's been wonderful to read his words and hear of his teaching across the years and around the world. Help us to be awakened anew to the love that brought him to Bethlehem as a saviour to rescue and redeem us, to the path he trod to Calvary, that he uh, might bring good news of forgiveness to us and to the whole world, and that as good shepherd, he offers daily care for all who seek his presence. Be with us as we connect with you and through you to each other now, for his name's sake. Amen. Well, <clears throat> Today in Matthew 25, we come to the conclusion of Jesus' teaching in Matthew's Gospel. The three stories in chapter 25 uh, challenge us with the concerns of the coming King. 
We will simply note four features of the three stories Jesus tells in this final segment. And the headings that I've chosen are simply the bridegroom, the wealth, the king, and the family. So let's think about those four things. First of all, the bridegroom. The bridegroom cometh. This is another wisdom story about being ready for an arrival. And it's a wedding story, but not as we know weddings. In Jesus' day, the long process of parent-arranged marriages, there were three stages, the engagement, the betrothal, and the marriage. In this sequence, it's the arrival of the bridegroom that marks the third stage. Jesus had earlier spoken of himself as the bridegroom in chapter 9. He said that fasting was inappropriate at such a time as the bridegroom was with them. And later on, he told the story of the wedding of the king's son in chapter 22. In both of these bridegroom stories, he references his own identity. That's the central idea. Israel as a whole had failed to recognize him. And now Jesus again presents himself as the bridegroom. This story features ten girls, as you heard Christine remark. Five were wise, but alas, five were foolish. The late night arrival of the bridegroom catches five girls unprepared with no oil for their lamps. They have to go and find some. And at the end of the story, the bridegroom doesn't recognize these five late girls. He declares, I don't know you. When too late, they return with their lamps lighted. We encountered this division between wise and foolish earlier in Jesus' teaching. In fact, in the very first block of teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, we, we discovered at the end the story of two builders, one wise and one foolish. And that story ended with the collapse of the foolish man's house. In Israel, proverbs about wisdom and folly I depict uh, two women uh, selling their wares in the streets, Lady Wisdom and Mistress Folly. And in Jesus' story, those two women have become the two groups of girls. The big picture of the story is the need to be prepared, which is emphasized with a similar story of an unexpected arrival in the parable of the three servants. Um, and that brings us to this second heading, the bridegroom. Now the wealth. He entrusted his property to them, we read, in uh, chapter uh, 14, uh, chapter 25, verses 14. So sadly, this story is reduced to an exam pass. You, you might remember the story. It's about a man who uh, left talents uh, and uh, it's... Uh, often understood to mean that if we are keen enough and, and active enough in the master's service, if we do the right thing, we'll be acceptable to God. That's very wide of the mark. It's not at all what Jesus is teaching. We've previously noted that in the culture of Jesus' day, a story about a servant and a master would usually be understood as about Israel and Israel's God, unseen and eternal Yahweh. In this case, the master has less three servants with Various huge sums of money, a single talent, was equal in value to 15 years' pay for a working man. The servants were judged to have differing abilities, so the first servant was given five talents, the second was given two, and the third was given one. And it's because of this distribution of these huge sums of money, uh, the word talent has become an English word for somebody's skill or ability, but in fact... It, it originally meant this colossal sum of money. Now, the multiplication of the resource by the first and second servants was commended. And this is growth. This is about the kingdom of God, like the parable of the virgins. It's about the kingdom of God. And it, it has a resonance with the parables that we looked at in chapter 13, where you might remember the, the mustard seed, the tiniest seed, grew into a large bush in which all the birds of the air could make their nests. It's another also of the allusions to the book of Daniel, which seems to have been in Jesus' mind a lot at this time. So what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of God has come, and everywhere there are signs of it, breaking into the lives of women and men, 
with power to heal and to save and to restore them. But in this story, the parable of the three servants, if you like, emphasis falls on the third servant who buried his talent in the field. And the suggestion is that the scribes and the Pharisees had the Holy Scriptures. This was part of the wealth that Israel had. They had the law of Moses. And we've noticed that Matthew has packaged uh, the five blocks of Jesus teaching as a kind of five uh, new Torah, if you like, a new teaching that's come to Israel. Uh, they had the prophets, the scribes and the Pharisees were the custodians of them. The, the, the scribes were the copiers of the law. Uh, they had the promises of God. They had the temple and the sign of God's very presence. But they effectively buried it. It was meant to be a blessing to the whole nations. All the nations of the earth were meant to come like the Queen of Sheba to Israel, but they didn't. Jesus had condemned the scribes and Pharisees for their hypocrisy. There's a jarring note at the close of the story. The wicked man th uh, thought he knew his master's character, and he, he actually says, I knew that you were a hard man. And he he, uh, we're told he is left outside in the dark where people weep and grind their teeth. 25 verse 30. This distressing ending matches the ending of this, this whole series of stories here. Compare it with a reference to the wicked servant in the, previous, the end of the previous chapter, 24 verse 51, who was gnashing his teeth. And also with reference to the unprepared girls in the, in the story of the girls. They were, the door was shut. And the final story with the sep its refer reference, this is the one we've still to come to, about the, the last judgment, the final judgment, where there's a reference to eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels in 25 verse 41. Christian artists have used these words to construct horrible pictures. The words themselves are intended to convey the sense of something awful. In the Good Weekend magazine last Saturday, Dr. Norman Swan, producer and presenter of the ABC Health Report, uh, who is both uh, Scottish and Jewish, a multi-award winning broadcaster, uh, spoke with great candour about his horror of death. We've come to rely on Norman Swan's sage advice regarding coronavirus and so many other aspects of health. It was sobering to read of the horror with which he viewed now, things so often glossed over with cliches by those who are bereaved. In contrast, the kingdom of God has, that God has committed to his human family is like the value of a talent to a servant. It's a joyful as a celebration of a wedding. It's as delightful as an unsought reward. It's a treasure unimaginable. But who bestows such riches? Uh, well, that's our third point. It's the king. And in the final story in chapter 25, we have the this, this statement that the son of man is king. Jesus says that the judge of all the nations will gather and the son of man will judge them. He will come in the glory and he will sit on the throne judging the nations. But then notice that in verse 34, he says, then the king will say to those on his right, the point being made here is that the Son of Man, that human name that means just on the one hand the human one, but also refers to Daniel, the one who was presented before the Ancient of Days and received a kingdom. This is the one who is the king. Renowned New Testament scholar and professor uh, Tasker at the University of London observes this is the only place in the Gospels where he speaks of the Son of Man as the King. Again and again, Jesus has told us about the Kingdom of Heaven. He's told us about it in words. He's demonstrated what it might mean in terms of healing and restoration. We've been encouraged to pray, Your Kingdom come. And Jesus has told us the parables of the Kingdom. What Kingdom? Now it's clear that the kingdom is his kingdom. In his suffering and death, he's going to wear a tag above his head that says, King of the Jews. He will experience what it's like 
to be shut out, like the uh, girls at the bridegroom uh, turned away. Why? He will experience that so that you and I may enter in. He will journey to a place of darkness and gnashing of teeth that we might belong to the light and experience joy. In finding his lost sheep, he will be forsaken. One day all humanity will bend the knee before the Son of Man because it is he who is the King. The Gospel is good news. It comes packaged in such a way that it invites a response. You and I are invited to bow the knee to Jesus as King. As Bob Dylan said, you've got to serve somebody. Cede your sovereignty to Jesus. Become part of his family. There's no one more interested in your well-being. How do we know that? Well, that brings us to the fourth heading, the family. He talks in this passage about judgment, about these brothers and sisters of mine. I want you to notice it. The awesome scene of a final judgment is familiar to us. One critical aspect of this story that is often overlooked is this. Both groups, the sheep and the goats, if you like, are divided on the basis of their treatment of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. The least of these. My family is another translation in verse, chapter 25, verse 40. We met this expression earlier in chapter 12, uh, verse 50, where Jesus explained that whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, the same is my mother and brother and sister. And so from these words, we gather that both the righteous and the unrighteous, the sheep and the goats, have behaved in particular ways towards those whom Jesus calls his family. Think for a moment of Jesus' frequent and preferential use of the term son of man. While this draws our attention to the unique character mentioned in Daniel, it also has that ambiguity of meaning human, truly human. Jesus identified with us in our mortality, the fact that we die. The writer to the Hebrews celebrates this. He says God, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Hebrews chapter 2. St. Paul too marvels in his great hymn in Philippians chapter 2. He did not think to cling to his divine form, but humbled himself, he says, taking the form of a servant. Like Paul on the Damascus road, persecution of Jesus' disciples is persecution of Jesus himself. The judgment seen in Matthew 25 divides humanity on the basis of how its treatment of Jesus' brothers and sisters is, is carried out. He came to redeem them from death, but it was through his own suffering and death that this was accomplished. This last teaching segment from Jesus in Matthew's Gospel is on the brink of the, pra the Passover precipice. Suffering and death await him, and he knows it. Matthew records immediately after this uh, story, after Jesus had finished all these words, he said, after two days, Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Why did he choose that path? It was for us, for you and me. Let us pray. Lord, we adore you for your awesome commitment to our welfare. You did not consider equality with the Father a thing to be clung to, then took the form of a servant, and being found in fashion as a man, you humbled yourself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Forgive our self-seeking and greed. Open our hearts that we might live as your brothers and sisters and share our lives as we are able. Grant your Holy Spirit to us and guide us at this time. Lord, we are distressed that a second wave of COVID-19 has created the need for another lockdown in Melbourne and that it has implications for all the states and territories. 
We pray for those who have tested positive to the virus and ask that they will get the best possible care that our community can offer and that those who have few symptoms will still self-isolate. We're mindful that the young and their parents, along with the elderly, are experiencing particular challenges of confinement and that so many of the active and able-bodied are without work and as concerned about what the future holds. We pray that grace and goodwill will prevail in all our relationships, that the physical needs of people experiencing distress will be met, and that people with mental health concerns will be cared for and supported. We pray for the decision makers at state and federal level. May they receive wise counsel and be guided with respect to schools and to the start of term three. May all their decisions achieve the best outcomes for the whole community. Teach us to experience that help and uh, to any human being is an act of service to the Son of Man, our King. Remind us to play our part by being generous with our time and our resources. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake, who taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep us now and always.